Thank you for being faithful to bring God's tithe. There's no sacrifice without obedience. Bring you the tithe into the storehouse, the tent, uh, and uh, God pours out his blessing uh, because of your heart to say, I believe in you, God, and I declare you and uh, sacrifice. So the month of October every year is the year that we give this miracle building fund offering. We're looking forward to an amazing facility that to really help us bless and minister to our kids. Our elementary students uh, are going to be having, uh, they need larger children's chapels. They need bigger classrooms and more of them. It's going to be secured. It's going to have uh, an area where, the, like a smaller gymnasium where they can do on Wednesday night the learning by activity. And uh, it's going to be awesome. We have a beautiful banquet hall that we, we needed, a, a world-class prayer room, prayer tower. Uh, we're looking forward to adult classes because we definitely need more adult spaces. We're very limited. That was one of the things we had to kind of give up. But we always put our early childhood, our elementary, our middle school, our high school, those are vital things. And, uh, and so we're looking forward to building all of that. And and, uh, and, and, and office complex because we're scattered all over everywhere. We have people in holes and corners over there and, you know, the offices, and it's really not the best. But uh, so it'll be nice to have an office complex with us being able to be together. So we look forward to that. We're going to break ground on the spring of, uh, of uh, 2020, and uh, we, re we get full use of the property further north there so that this whole grass area will end up being built on, and then there'll be parking north of that and more new parking. We're going to put in a lot of parking. And uh, so uh, that'll be, I believe, as we move forward, paid for cash as we build it. And so that's an awesome thing. And in the meantime, we carry on. Uh, we give to missions. We serve. We love. We forgive. We're a community. We prefer one another. We honor one another. We stir up the zeal of God within us. And we care about and love the people who are blind, who cannot help being blind and cannot see, who do not know, with the mission of t giving Jesus to everybody. Uh, I don't want to just be a, a sermon church, uh, a music church that just does music for people to enjoy, or a sermon that makes your ears tickle. I want to be a community, and we need to work hard at being a community. Uh, and, and you need to show that's why hospitality is, is, is elevated in the ministry, to open your home, to invite people in, to build community. That's why when they were full of the Holy Spirit, they broke bread together daily. They were sharing in the, in the faith with each other, and they took care of each other. There have been a lot of disasters around the world, haven't there? I mean, it's everywhere. Hurricanes, it's things we don't even hear about in other countries that are going on. I mean, there's earthquakes other places. We're seeing earthquakes, hurricanes, fires, uh, all kinds of stuff, and God bless those people that uh, were victims of uh, those families of, of the, the mass shootings, and they're happening all over and different things. And you know, the the world is the world is kind of going like this. And as a church, we don't want to be vertical with them like that. We want to stay like this. We want to uphold the highest standard of God's word and His truth. And uh, so, uh, Mexico was really affected and there's a great church that David and Kelly Grimm know the, the, the missionary people, the people that planted the church and their church was devastated and I'd like for you to help me do a generous dollar blessing. I think they need three 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 thousand dollars something like that, 3600 I don't remember exactly and we want to help them because they don't have the money you know the people that are there are poor, their lives have been devastated, their own their own things through these earthquakes so I'm going to ask the, the guys if you could I did it in the early and gave away my, my cash so if it was a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars, if you're blessed whatever it is, just let's just do this for this couple and uh, Dave and Kelly have been there personally they know them, they've worked with this mission so they can verify that this is a gospel preaching great uh, church and great people and so we're going to send that check this week uh, Dave, I'm a forgetter we'll get the money and then I'll forget for six months to send it so you're responsible to remind the old man. I want to welcome those of you. Which camera am I looking into? Yours? Hi, y'all. Some of you couldn't be here today. I know some of you are in Tennessee. Some of you are, I don't even know where. You might be out there with Pastor Jeff on the, and Jeannie on the Blue Sea. You may be down in Houston helping that church uh, rebuild. Thank you. 
You may be sick. You might be just watching because you weren't able to be here on vacation. Or maybe you're watching this coming Wednesday as you go back and pull up our live stream as you can watch it any time. I want to say thank you. You're welcome to you. I hope that the Holy Spirit will speak to you as we come to you with the Word of God today. Uh, John chapter 8 is where we're going to begin in just a moment. And uh, we've been started a series, Jesus Is. So turn to John 8. As you turn, let me mention, <clears throat> a lot of people don't understand something. Maybe your church background or you have no church background. I want to explain two things. One is right now, those of you that have children, your children are in children's church. And children's church is, is similar to this church, only different age appropriate for the children. It's not a Bible study class. Just an hour ago, we had Bible study, graded Sunday school, Bible studies for children. And your children need to come during that Sunday school hour. You need to bring them here so they're in a class with their grade studying and they're systematically gone through the whole Bible and then they have their church after that. And you should be in a Bible study. And people a lot of times don't understand that. They call, I come to church, I send my kids to Sunday school. That's not Sunday school up there. That's children's church. And then we have church tonight. It's not another Sunday morning service where they're alike. It's totally different. We sing different songs. The reason we have a Sunday night service is not just to offer another slot, but to offer another opportunity to come to be able to worship God, to pray, to teach and learn more. And it's very important. And this end of the world series, you, you, you're going to hear stuff that's important to understand that's theology and not pie in the sky, circumstantial stuff that uh, has to do with current events. And any time we can be alerted to how to keep our hope in Christ and to purify ourselves as we have this hope, it's important to do so. I don't believe in the whole fear tactics and like, oh, oh, it's going to come today, so let's, get, let's make things right. You know, this is the time, you know, because all these things are going on. I believe in every day, and I think Pastor Jeff may have mentioned that, every day there's an imminent return of Christ. And I don't care if there's no tornadoes, no hurricanes, no fires, no floods, nothing going on. Jesus is still coming and he could come. In fact, the Bible mentions that they'll be eating and drinking and giving in marriage and stuff. It will be life as usual and people will be saying, they've said it forever, he's not going to come. And then suddenly, in the twinkling of an eye in a moment, the Bible says, talks about him coming. So I'd urge you to be there and I'll tell you what. You should invite people because people are people in our culture are interested. They're wondering what the world's going on all around the world. The world's going crazy. I urge you to invite people to come and learn and hear a great message from Pastor Hawkins. Well, today I, I'm titled this, Jesus Is, this is our series, Jesus Is the Great I Am. He's the Great I Am. And it's from John 8. And what I want you to take from this is that Jesus is not just a teacher, not just a great role model. He's not just another God. He is the one true God, the only God, the risen from the dead. He is the almighty God. And I want you to take from the fact that, number one, that if he is truly almighty God, then he deserves our lives. He's overall. I want you to also take from the fact that if he truly is almighty God, as he claims to be, then there's nothing too difficult for him, nothing impossible for him. He has all power. He's everywhere present. He knows all things, and he's able to do anything. And God is here, and he can meet, meet you in your time of need. And the other thing I want you to know is that his name is the I Am. He is a holy God, and we are to be careful. The one commandment, the third, says don't take God's name in vain, and you need to be careful about that. Uh, and so let's dig in here, John 8. Uh, first, uh, as you hold it there, I'm going to mention that one of the cardinal doctrines of the church is that Jesus is the virgin birth of Jesus. Why is it important that Jesus was born of a virgin? Because God, the Father, is his Father, therefore Jesus was born without sin. He's the second Adam. He's born without a sin nature, and he did no sin. He knew no sin, and therefore his sacrifice was for our sin, and it was a worthy sacrifice, and his blood is able and has the power to cleanse us from all of our sins. He is God incarnate, come to earth. Of John 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. 
Jesus, this word. And we're going to see, through him all things were made. Notice that. This is talking about Jesus. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness but the, uh, it says, but the darkness has not understood it. And then it jumps down. It tells us who it is. In verse 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testifies concerning me. In other words, guys, listen. Jesus Christ is there in the beginning. Let us make man in after our own image. And it refers to in the plural of the creation of the world. Why is this theology important, being the born of a virgin and Jesus being God and being deity? It's important because otherwise you water down everything and there is this person, Jesus, who's a great teacher and a, and a great person and, 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 and people that follow, he's just another God. He didn't make anything. He has no power. Let me tell you something. Our God is the one true God. Jesus is the only one risen from the dead. He is alive. He is the reason and the conviction by the Spirit that makes people born again that the whole Booyer family stood around Barb as she was dying and had a peace and had a confidence and sang songs of heaven and was sure that this life, this temporary life they're just passing through is not the life. There is an eternal life. In fact, the, the Bible, when it uses the word death, is talking about spiritual death, which is eternal separation from God. We don't die. We pass from life to life. We pass from temporary life, earthly life, with a temporary shell, a temporary body, into an eternal life, a forever life that's in Christ Jesus. And so Jesus himself leaves no doubt. In fact, you go throughout the New Testament, and whether it's implied or said directly, you'd have to take out a whole lot of the New Testament and the Gospels to, if you took out all the scriptures that pointed to the fact that Jesus Christ is God Almighty, that he's divinity, that he's divine. Let me tell you something. You can go visit the graves of all the other gods. There's only one God, one maker of heaven and earth, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the great I am who is none other than Jesus Christ. In fact, when Abraham was offering up Isaac and he went there and he was about to take Isaac's life as a sacrifice in obedience to God his father, God stopped him and he showed him a ram caught in a thicket. And then God speaks and he said, he says this, I will provide, he will provide himself or I am providing myself. In the essence of it, God says, I am providing myself the sacrifice. It doesn't need to be this animal or any, or, I mean Isaac, or anything else, and the animal is the picture that God was going to be the sacrifice. So God, according to Paul in Philippians 2, says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God, because he was equal with God, but he took up no uh, reputation for himself, and he humbled himself, and took on the form of a servant, became a man, and he humbled himself, and became obedient to the death of the cross. This is Jesus Christ. He became, God himself in the flesh became our substitute for our sin and he died. This is the great I am. This is the one that spoke from the burning bush and told Moses, I am the great I am. In John chapter 8, Jesus is talking to people uh, that are actually very interested in him. They like him. They like his teaching. They're following him. They've seen him do a lot of things. This is not some unbelieving crowd. This is a crowd that knew him. And so he's there, and we begin in John 8, 48. Jesus, the Jews answered him, aren't we right in saying that you're a Samaritan and demon-possessed? I'm not seeking glory for myself, Jesus said, but there is one who seeks it, and he's the judge. In other words, God, my Father, wants to be glorified. God the Father glorifies Jesus. That's what Jesus is saying. Verse 51, he says, Verily, truly, I tell you, whoever obeys my word will... Obey my word, you're not going to die? You're going you're gonna, to you're you're live eternal? At this they exclaim, Now we know you have a, you're demon-possessed. 
Abraham died and so did the prophets. Yet you say that whoever obeys your word will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died and so did the prophets. If I said I didn't know him, I'd be a liar like you. But I do know him and obey his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. I'll stop there to just make commentary. He's saying Abraham could see the day ahead by eyes of faith and rejoiced at the day of Jesus Messiah coming to earth. Why, what's he referring to there? He's referring to the promise of Abraham when God told Abraham out of his seed he would bless all nations and all people. So we go down through history and guess who Mary is related to? She's a seed of Abraham. And Mary gives birth to Jesus the Son. And he blesses all nations. And Abraham was rejoicing and believed the word of God that through him that the nations would be. So this, Abraham rejoiced in faith, seeing and knowing. And yet, he goes on, verse 57, they say, you're not yet 50 years old, they said to him, and you've seen Abraham? In other words, they're just saying, well, you're talking crazy. Very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham, here it is, before Abraham was born, before Abraham was born, I am I am at this they picked up stones to stone him why because Leviticus 24 said if you blaspheme the name of God you blaspheme him then you get stoned to death immediately and they thought they were doing right they didn't understand they picked up stones to stone him but Jesus hid himself slipping away from the temple grounds and this wasn't time there was no way they were going to take his life so before we continue on that passage we have to look back where is this I am coming from so I want you to turn to Exodus chapter 3 starting in verse 1 and read the the old dialogue of Moses and Moses you remember who that guy was right Moses was tending the flock of Jethro his father-in-law the priest of Midian and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to, to Horeb the mountain of God there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush and Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I'm going to go over there and see this strange sight. Why does the bush burn but not burn up? When the Lord saw that he'd gone over to look, God called from him from within the bush. Moses, Moses. If I'd have been Moses, I don't know what I'd have done. That would have been, scared me to death. Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy God, holy ground, rather. Let me tell you something. Guys, when we designate a place where the presence of God is for us to pray and preach and bring God's word and teach God's word and worship God, there's times when God's spirit shows up that it's indeed that way. And I don't know how it is that you would express it, but there are some things inappropriate in the midst of a place of worshiping God. And I, I'm not going to get legalistic on you, but I'm just going to ask you to have the mindset that you worship a holy God. I mean, what did Jesus teach us to pray? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Holy be thy name. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, Isaiah said. When the Lord's train and glory filled the temple, he bowed down and he said, woe is me, I'm a man of un." clean lips and I live among a generation of unclean lips and he realized who he was and how holy God was and he declared and always when it's in triple it's holy 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 it's the greatest highest emphasis Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come we see it repeated in the revelation we see it repeated around the throne room of God and you if you see the greatness and holiness of God you yourself will fall, fall down that's why holy 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 is the greatest in my opinion hymn ever written but that's just my opinion. And then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God, and so would have I. 
The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt, and I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the, the ites. Uh, and now the cry of the Israelites have reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh, Moses, to bring my people the Israelites out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Remember, he's a shepherd, he's old, he doesn't have an army. Are you with me? He's wanted for murder. He's been hiding out in the desert for 40 years. For 400 years, the Israelites had not heard from God. He's supposed to go tell the Israelites to talk about God and deliver them out. They don't forgot about God. They don't even know God's name. So, and God says, I'll be with you. Let me tell you something. Whatever that God asks you to do, these are the words to remember. God, when he asks you to go, he are not sending you by yourself. He says, I'll be with you. When he says, go into all the world, that's the promise of, and lo, I will be with you even to the end of the world. Let me tell you something. The heart of God is so great toward the lost toward the sick, toward those who need him, that he's not going to ever let you go out there by yourself. He's going to go with the power of his spirit and the truth of his word. He's going to help you. And there are so many people, they, they know about religion and they've got a bit missed, messed up perspective about it. But there's a Jesus that's the real, that's powerful, that can save them and change them and be real to them and turn their hearts around from being selfish to see in the things that God sees and feeling things, feeling about things the way God feels about them, changing your hearts. He said, I'll be with you in verse 12, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain, which happened. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the, <laughs> suppose, he's trying to talk God out. So suppose I go to these Israelites who, who hadn't even thought of you for a long time. It's been 400 years. And, and, the God of your fathers, and say, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. I am who I am. This is what you're to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. I am has sent me to you. Underline that in your Bibles. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call from gener- call me from generation to generation. And so we see the story, and so we say, what do we need to understand? We need to understand that the highest expression of divine self-reverence that has ever been spoken, Jesus claimed for himself. This is the Mount Everest among all the names and titles of ever given to God, ever, that God gives to himself. In giving himself this name, God is proclaiming, I am eternal. I am, I have no beginning, I have no end. Everything exists because of me. I am who I am, and nothing about that will ever change. You see, nobody but God can ever go against this name. This, this name is the greatest name, I am. And let me tell you, Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, it says this. I am the, speaking of the revelation of Jesus Christ, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and the end, who was and is and is to come, the Almighty. And you shall call his name Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, Almighty God, Jesus Christ, the Babe, the born of a virgin one, God himself incarnate in human flesh. This name for God came to have a place of central importance for the generation of Jews that followed Moses. The third commandment, commandment etched is, uh, in the stones is to never use God's name in vain. Never. God's name was a holy name, a name which a, no reverent Jew would ever speak, write, or even spell. In fact, they spelled it without the vowels. They spelled it Y-H-W-H so that no one could actually say it out loud. Now we know it's Yahweh. We know, maybe they knew, but they weren't to say it. And no Jew would dare say that name. God was simply too holy, too righteous, too far above to even utter his name. In fact, for those who did, the punishment then was death. 
Thank God for his grace. But God's name today is tossed around in culture like a cheap toy. Even in the church, we casually, we casually tend to speak of the name of God. We just say, oh God. Or we'll just use versions of it or the letter G or whatever. We, 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 don't, we don't hallow his holy name. Um, and as Jesus taught us, hallowed be thy name. You know, what does the way we use the name of God tell us about what we think of the person of God? What does the way we use the name of God tell us what we think about the person of God? God Almighty, Father God. That's my question. But the more they listened to Jesus talk, the more and more upset they got. And uh, John chapter 8, 31 talks about the, who he was talking to. This is John 8 that we read the text in. And it says, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples. That's important because they're following him. These aren't enemies. People are, these are people who like some of the things he had to say. Some of them had seen big stuff that he had done, and they were pro-Jesus crowd at that point, but they, they just couldn't seem to hear his claims. You know, they couldn't seem to get it that this, he's saying, I am the Messiah, I am God Almighty. They considered Jesus a friend, a good teacher, and a wise man, and that he was. But it was becoming more and more clear that Jesus in his claims himself is claiming himself as deity, the great I am. He was demanding more, much more than just being a good teacher or a friend or someone that could, they could count on. He was claiming himself as God and therefore demanding total devotion from them, absolute devotion. In 40, verse 48, they become frustrated enough in John 8, 48 to call Jesus a Samaritan and of, the, of, the, of a devil. And Jesus says, right. Then he says, whoever keeps my word will never see death. Jesus says, they're really upset now. They're going to stone him. He's promised to deliver us from the thing that we fear most, which is death. And it's an audacious promise only that could come from someone that has power over life and death. He's the author of life. You know, he's the, the humanity uh, is Jesus reaches down to make us and he takes that which he'd already created, the dirt, he builds a man and he breathes life into it. Everything else he spoke, he said, let there be. And you can say, well, did he do that through, through uh, setting forth a process of evolution? I don't know. I'm not wise. There's two different people that believe God's absolute creator. I don't really care. But I do want to tell you this, he has the power, he's the creator. Now, I, I happen to have my, my thoughts on that, but some people call me ignorant when I, when I speak them. But I believe in a literal six days of creation, the seventh day he rested. That's what I personally believe. But there's, if you study it, and someday we're going to have a conference, you'll see there's reason to see the other. And uh, so we'll let you decide from there. So to claim the power over death itself is a claim that you stand above life and death, and that is to put simply a claim to being divine, and he's suggesting that he is God, and now they say it again, you have a demon. We know you have a demon now. Even Abraham, our great father, couldn't cheat death, and you're telling your, us that you're greater than Abraham? Who do you think you are, Jesus? Funny you should mention that. Funny you should mention Abraham, Jesus says, since you brought him up. Let me point out to you that your ancestor Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it, he was glad, as I've already mentioned. Of course, Abraham could not begin to understand how seeing that day and how it would all unfold, but he believed it and he was counted righteous because of his faith and believed the promise, the seed of Abraham would bring salvation to the whole world. So Abraham was filled with joy. But the crowd doesn't get it. All they can say is in response is you're not even 50 years old and you've, and you've seen Abraham. The truth is right there in front of, of their eyes and they're completely unable to see it and that's when Jesus drops the hammer. Very truly I tell you before Abraham, I am. That, those words, I am, the most succinct words to say I am God. See, Jesus isn't just another God. He's not just another person to follow. He's not just one of many of, of, of the uh, Hindu gods that they're gonna add in. He is the only one true God, the only one that hears, the only one that answers, the only one that saves, the only one that is creator God. Jesus is I am. And as soon as the crowd hears Jesus say these words, the time for talking was over. Now it was time for violence. They immediately were told the people run to pick up rocks and move in to stone Jesus. They don't get a rope to hang him. They don't get a sword to run through him. In this case, 
According to the Jewish laws, I mentioned in Leviticus 24, anybody that blasphemed the holy, unspeakable name of God, the person was to be immediately stoned to death. And in their minds, the law was about to be justly applied to Jesus. And all along, I suspect that these people didn't want to believe what it sounded like Jesus was saying, that he was saying he was, he was divine. Now they had no choice. They couldn't deny it. Neither can we. With these two words, I am, Jesus takes the highest expression of divine self-reference -re -re ever given, the name which God first used of himself to Moses in the burning bush, and he takes it for his own. No Jew would ever speak it, write it, or even spell it, and Jesus takes the name and not only speaks it aloud, but claims it for himself. He says, I am. One of the important things is not just how did they take it then when they wanted to stone him, but how do you take it? What is your response to Jesus' claims? Because if you believe that, he has a claim on your life, on all things created. Let's be honest, there's a tendency in our world, even among those of us in a church, to accept Jesus as a friend and a helper and, and a good person and a teacher and a counselor and a wise and a role model and all that kind of stuff. And that he is, but he's more. You know, C.S. Lewis once wrote, I believe Pastor Hawkins mentioned this, and I want to quote one of his writings. He says, a man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. And let me add, like a lot of other people will say. He would either be a lunatic on a level with the man who says he's a poached egg, or else he'd be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up. You, you can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher only. I add only my word. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. He claims deity. I am who I am. I am. He is the great I am. Did you know that he's the creator of all the world? He's almighty God. Do you know that between the earth and the sun, there's 93 million miles and if you did an illustration of taking that 93 million miles and making that equal to one piece of copy paper, the Milky Way, our galaxy alone, would take copy paper stacked 310 miles high to reach the depth, the height, the essence of the Milky Way. And yet our galaxy is so small and there's galaxies as many as the, the sand on the seashore the universe is so grand, more than we can ever begin to imagine. It's unbelievable. Colossians 1, 16 and 17, this Jesus Christ who they crucified, this Jesus Christ who claimed that he was the I am, the one that Moses said, this Jesus Christ, it says of Jesus in Colossians 1, 16 and 17, by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, where the thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. In other words, he picked you up, he made you out of dirt, he breathed into you, and if he didn't exist anymore, you would crumble, you would disintegrate, you would not be, and nothing, gravity, nothing would hold together. The universe would fall apart, all things would go chaotic, and everything would be destroyed. But by his very existence, by his very power, by his very being, the great I am holds all together. Is this the sort of person that you're going to ask into your life to be your assistant? Is this the sort of person to whom you're going to say, don't call me, I'll call you? Or I'll do this for you as long as you do that for me. Is that, is that true? Is this the sort of person you imagine that you can just relegate to the edges of your life? Is this the sort of person you can question when he gives a command? Is this the sort of person about whom you can say, I like some of what he teaches, but I don't really believe it all. Is Jesus, if Jesus truly is who he claimed to be, if he is the eternal I am, the same one who spoke to Moses from the burning bush that day, if he's the creator and ruler of the universe, if this is who Jesus is, then there's nothing we can do but take all limits off of our allegiance to him and be totally devoted in allegiance, in allegiance to Jesus Christ. If this is who Jesus is, he deserves our complete 
and undivided devotion, and we can trust him. Most people today, they're like the crowds back then. And you're going to go, wait a minute, I'm not like that. I believe that. No. A lot of people in church are just like this. They like Jesus. They like a lot of what Jesus stands for. They value his friendship. They hope that along the way he can do some good things for them. They want to be counted among his followers. They're willing to be called Christian. They give some of their time. They give some of their attention. They give some of their possessions, some of their choices. But when he says, I am, I am Lord. I am the great I am. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the bread of life. And when Jesus starts demanding it all, they turn on him. As many people did then and do now. So let me ask you, as you bow your head, musicians come, is Jesus your master? You answer that. Ask God, are you my master? Do I believe your creator? Do I believe you're the great I am? Have you submitted to the lordship in your life? Do you believe that God can do anything and that if you ask him, he loves you and he has the power to do anything for you and help you? Are you willing to go wherever he goes because he's mighty God? Do whatever he asks of you because he's mighty God. Give away whatever he asks you to because he's mighty God. Love whoever he loves because he's mighty God. He's the I am. Jesus doesn't want half of our lives. He doesn't want half of, of mine or yours. We can't just serve Jesus part time or worship Jesus some of the time. He's either our master or he's not. Simply no space in between. If we confess Jesus Christ the Lord and believe in our heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead, Paul says in Romans to the letter at the church at Rome, then you'll be saved. Do you believe Jesus is Lord, that he has risen from the dead? Will you confess it <clears throat> and believe it? If we trust him and bow before Jesus as the great I am, the preexistent, eternal, sovereign, all-powerful, all-knowing, loving, and gracious and compassionate ruler of the universe that he is. If we give ourselves to him, we can find and we will know that what he has given to us in return is life and that life eternal. For very, very truly he tells us in this story, whoever keeps my word will never see death. Are you sure that if you were to die today that you would wake up in God's heaven? Are your sins forgiven? Is Christ truly there? As the Bible asks the question, does your spirit bear witness with God's spirit and God's spirit with your spirit that you're a child of God? Has the Holy Spirit come into your heart and changed you? Or have you just believed in your mind? Have you called on Jesus? Is he alive? This morning, I'll ask those that would like to pray with people to come and let's all stand together. And if you need a miracle from a mighty God where nothing is impossible, if you need a miracle from the great I am, if you need forgiveness of sins from the great I am, if you need to know that God is always with you and not will never leave you and will always help you because he is mighty God and he knows you and has every hair on your head numbered, then you're here, you can call on him and he will hear, hear you. <clears throat> if you want to make his name holy hallowed be thy name and you want to declare God from now on I'm going to reverence you in a special way knowing who you are and I'm not going to be so flippant about my time with you in your presence you're not the good old boy upstairs the great big grandpa up there you're mighty God before you we stand holy 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 how great thou art